Good evening, everyone, and uh, apologies for the uh, slight delay in starting tonight. Had a few little uh, gremlins along the way. So, uh, but anyway, we're here. Now, uh, as I say, a few little gremlins. So we might not be able to do everything that we were hoping tonight in this latest edition of uh, Slew's Practical Astronomy series. But the main thing that we were going to be looking at tonight, uh, we'll hop over, by the way, to... Uh, the discussion balls in case you've got any questions for me about our subject matter tonight or anything else about the telescopes or using SLU. But the main thing that we were going to look at tonight uh, was a little look back on our rather successful and rather good fun Messier Marathon. Wow, I want to do it again this weekend. Actually, the moon's up this weekend, so it wouldn't be great, but uh, I want to do it again anyway. I want to do it with Chile online. That would be really cool. Uh, so we can get all those really southern objects, if you remember those ones that we were struggling with. But uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I don't know, M30 at the end of the Messier Marathon, I was on tender hooks. The very last object, we weren't quite sure, were we? Whether or not we were going to catch them. We looked at the Canary 4 telescope, the Solar System telescope. We looked at the Canary 3 telescope, the Deep Sky telescope. Those were the two that I thought we're going to get M30. But what I discovered the day after was that we've got some hardware limits on those mounts. And it was it was less than half a degree too low to get those. But for anybody who uh, missed it uh, the, the whole night, uh, we weren't using Canary 1, the half meter telescope that night. And that's because uh, it was too windy, but very close to the end, about half an hour, 45 minutes before the end of the night, I looked at the wind conditions. And I thought, you know, we might be able to open Canary 1. And we opened. We had half the dome shut to kind of keep it a bit sheltered from the wind. And would you believe it? That very last mission, Canary 1, was the only telescope to capture that globular cluster that was only four degrees above the horizon, Messier 30. So unless we'd done that, we would have got 109 objects and fallen at the very last hurdle. How disappointing would that have been after that entire night? But anyway, if you did manage to stay up that night and uh, keep me company for 10 hours, then thank you very much. I know a lot of people did. And uh, but anyway, that's what we're going to look at tonight. We're going to look at uh, that poster um, that you can create from all the images that you captured during that Messier marathon. And, you know, if you if you haven't if you didn't do it for the Messier marathon, then, you know, there's no better place to start. If you're a newbie to astronomy, no better place to start than to start collecting the Messier objects, 110 of the biggest and brightest objects in the night sky. Every single one of them is a crowd pleaser. So anyway, we're going to take a little look at how you can do that poster. So you can kind of adapt the Messier Marathon poster and you can still do it because you know, you can uh, over a period of days, weeks or even months, you can do it over a whole year. And if you do it over a whole year, you can actually capture all of those objects, not when they're four degrees above the horizon, but when they're directly overhead when they're placed at their best. So anyway, uh, I want to show you a couple of examples of that um, before we take a look at how you can create one yourself. We're going to look at a couple of options on how to do that. One with PowerPoint and the other one with any image processing tool. But I would just like to share with you uh, a couple of the examples. But before we do that, Let's uh, hop over to the telescopes because I know we brought the Canary Islands online earlier on. Let's take a look at Canary 2. Had a bit of cloud and we weren't sure whether to open or not. Ooh, look, there's that dreaded shutter issue that we didn't see very much of uh, over the last week. But uh, that's not very good. That's these streak stars and uh, we've got a new shutter uh, that's going to be ordered as soon as the manufacturer can lay their hands on one but uh, let's take a look at the canary ultra wide field we ought to check sky conditions oh look moon so whenever you see a moon mission by the way this is the current mission but the canary wide field we don't look at the moon with that one which is why 
you don't see an image in the Canary Wide Field for if you're wondering. But let's take a quick look at conditions because we were suffering some cloud. So let's look at the all sky camera. Okay, that's pretty good. So that cloud has uh, moved off, but uh, I think we're due for it to come in in kind of waves. So we'll persevere tonight and uh, see if we can do it. And in fact, if you want to see the conditions, don't forget you can always use the time lapse. Let's take a look at this. Uh, I've used this, by the way, for donkey's years. Um, and uh, let's take it on to today so you can see that's why we didn't have the solar telescope online today. It was rather cloudy. But I've used this for years. But uh, So it was great to uh, make this available in the observatory information panel uh, on the telescope pages so you lot can see it. So every day, every morning, you can pop in and there are those clouds that stopped us opening earlier. Look, it was, in fact, it's still still there up until a few minutes ago in fact uh, but it means that you can look at last night and you can see even the the tiniest little bit of cloud and stuff like that so we were under an alpha alert last night and that cloud that's why we weren't open last night but uh, let's take a quick look at the weather forecast so I think we've got yeah we've got um pretty poor forecast for tonight slight chance of high humidity and cloudy partly cloudy tomorrow light clouds so we've got a really mixed week haven't we at the Canary Islands, but uh, we'll have a look at the uh, dome cam. And don't forget, you can see the time lapse here as well. And uh, that's always good to look at. If you're wondering if the uh, if the solar telescope isn't online, then you can take a look at this and see exactly why. And there's the reason. But uh, actually, let's take a quick look at Chile while we're here, uh, because Chile won't be too far off opening, I would think. So we've lost our all sky camera there, so we can't check that at the moment. Uh, that should be, I thought that was going to be restarted today, but uh, they haven't got to that. Take a look at the weather forecast. Okay. Clear, 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 clear. So when we're without our all sky camera, if that ever happens, what we have to do is actually, uh, as long as the weather forecast, we still got the weather, the live telemetry coming through from the weather station. So as long as that looks okay, what we do is we open and we have to judge by the first images uh, whether or not uh, it's clear or not and there's there's an easy way of telling if it's clear in your images in fact there's a great example on the home page at the moment so uh, i've forgotten who it was but somebody shared a bit of slew art from last night because it clouded over last night in chile there you go now if you ever see an image like that um or it's got some weird coloring over the top of it then that's usually cloud so uh, thanks lewis Showing a bit of slew art there. So uh, anyway, so Canary Islands is looking quite good. Uh, Chile is going to be coming online yeah, in about uh, 45 minutes, I guess, something like that. Uh, let's take a look at the schedule. Take a look. It's all right. Um, British summertime has, has just started, so I'm not on UTC anymore. So first mission starts 23.40. Oh, no, so we got... We've got quite a time actually, it's over an hour away before Chile starts, so that's why I'm ahead with um, English summer time. So that's why astronomers always try and use UTC. We had an interesting conversation, didn't we, uh, during the Messier Marathon about uh, how members want us to show time on the website, you know, because we've tried to cover, you know, the USA, but and put EDT and PDT down that specific time and Eastern time plus UTC. But what that's landed up with is, you know, an awful lot of information. Whereas, I don't know, we were kind of saying, and a lot of members agreed, there are a few little things if you're starting out in astronomy, especially with robotic telescopes like SLUs, a few little things that would just be good to learn because ultimately they make it a lot, lot easier. And if you get used to UTC, this is this uniform time. It's called universal coordinated time, coordinated universal time. Um, and it comes from the French, uh, which is why it's UTC. Um, and if you can get used to using that and just accept it as the time zone that are used by observatories, get that time zone UTC in relationship to your own local time zone. And suddenly it all makes sense you know so anyway if you want to learn a little bit more there's a little pop up here and actually in the discussion boards uh, there's a link there's a post there which gives you more information about coordinated universal time but anyway 
So uh, we still got some time then to wait for Chile to open. So let's hop over to our community boards. So let's take a look. Most recent, what's going on? We've got uh, some Jupiter moons going on at the moment. Uh, oh, Brian, Brian D is back. Oh, hi, Brian. Uh, he's, oh, Brian's back as slew crew. Come on, Brian. You know how to use the telescopes. Sign up as a slew astronomer again. So uh, what else we got? Oh, Christina. Christina is back now. Christina is uh, our comet hunting fan. Quite a few members do this, but uh, Christina's actually headed up quite a few of the pro-am, that's professional astronomers and amateur astronomers, getting together uh, using the SLU telescopes and other telescopes, professional telescopes, for some of the observing campaigns. So uh, Christina's just pointing out here that she's going to be oh, imaging uh, C 2015-01 pan stars with uh, the Canary 2 telescopes. This is in the CATS comet group. So anybody who's interested in comets, and I'll tell you, they really are interesting things to, to look at uh, through SLU's telescopes. Um, they are fascinating and it's really easy. You have to be a SLU astronomer member really to do it because you have to set up coordinate missions, but it, it's addictive as Christina found when Christina joined SLU. Uh, what is it? Uh, it says that uh, 2012, is it? Um, she knew nothing about comets, but was just had this deep fascination with them. And within a year, you know, she was, uh, you know, doing the uh, near earth object, near earth asteroid training course uh, so that she could make submissions to the minor planet and center and stuff like that. And, and then got really heavily into comets. So anyway, what are you doing, Christina here? So observing this comet, uh, a couple of goals here got obtain enough luminance exposures 50 seconds uh, for a deep mono stack so she's going to stack together lots of luminance uh, filtered exposures because that's a good way of extracting more detail out of very faint objects um, oh and uh, Christine is going to make an animation of the comet's motion over a three hour span. So that is a pretty cool one to watch. That's gonna be starting in yeah, a couple of hours time. So that'll be good. Um, yeah, now if you want to know how to set up a coordinate mission or where you'd get the coordinates for a comet, then uh, search back over a, a couple of practical astronomy uh, broadcasts, a couple of shows ago and uh, you can go up to browse live cast you can see the recent ones and uh, go back and i showed you exactly how to do that it may have been the uh, beginning of the month so try down here somewhere down here and i showed you exactly how to set up and it's really quite easy it's not that difficult as soon as you've got the coordinates but uh, anyway what what is christina actually looking at so what does all this mean you know so c forward slash 2015 01 pan stars in brackets well it's not some badly formed url with the forward slash in it the um the c means it's a comet basically and if you saw a p in a comet name like uh 43p it's a periodic comet but this one isn't a periodic comet uh so this is going to be a one and only trip into the inner solar system might come back in kind of longer than two years but then it's classed as it's not really classed as a periodic comet you know. so anyway c 2015 2015 is just the year that it was discovered the 01 the o just specifies which month of the year it was and then the one uh is the number uh th that so this is the first one uh discovered in a two-week period which is what the o represents and then the stuff in uh, brackets there that's the uh, pan stars all sky survey so they were the discoverer and you know comets are one of the few astronomical discoveries that can carry your name carries the name of the discoverer we discover a supernova a supernova is just known as kind of sn and then a bunch of numbers so that's no good uh discover an asteroid that's just given a whole bunch of numbers as well um but a comet stands alone so i've always thought if you're going to discover anything in astronomy a comet is the one to do it. and i'm still waiting for 
Comet Slew. So uh, anyway, keep an eye open in the Cats Comet group because I know Christine has been off quite a while, but she does intend to pick up the activity in the Comet attributes and monitoring Comet group. So keep an eye over there. It can be quite good fun. Um, yeah, and she's talking about a, a new campaign for 41p. So these are the four XP comets. So there's a whole series of periodic comets that the CATS group have been working with professional astronomers with. Um, so highly recommend you uh, hop over there, have a look. So what else have we got in discussions at the moment? Um, dum -de -dum -de -dum. Jupiter again, you know, some Keith, thank you very much, Keith. Uh, oh, Meshane's Galaxy. Always got to, if you ever see David M, all right, make a post and he normally puts it in this kind of form the name and the telescope always take a look at this david is one of our best image processors so he doesn't just collect the uh, real-time color images that are generated by slu no david collects loads of the raw data and some of that data you you hear of sometimes in fact he's mentioned it here look it says from one set of fits now fits is just a it's like an image format it's a file format that astronomical ccd cameras generate and in fact all of the slu telescopes generate fits data and what slu does is you know so if we're on the telescope pages what we're seeing in here is the result of slu's patented technology so let's take a look at uh, canary 2 again see what's in oh look at that one of my favorites another messier object messier 101 from daryl s uh, daryl's been writing quite a bit in the discussion boards recently quite interesting so pinwheel galaxy so what we're doing slew's patented technology is taking that fits data in real time from those ccd cameras and processing them together to stream out first of all these uh grayscale images and then it turns into color uh, as the other filtered images get added into that so that's what you know that's what's happening behind the scenes even for your images that you get in my pictures but david takes some um, a set of data and spends far more time processing it and look at this wow david i've never seen a machine's galaxy like this before you know and i don't think i've ever noticed these two smaller galaxies. So where I'm pointing up here, that's another galaxy in the background. And there's another, it looks like a spiral. It doesn't look like an elliptical galaxy, does it? It looks like another spiral galaxy just to the south. And in fact, there's a couple of small blobs in the galaxy itself as well. I wonder what they are, but David, what an astounding job. And one of the difficulties of processing some of these galaxies is their cores are so bright in comparison to their wispy and fuzzy outer arms. So whenever you want to pull up the detail, we're going to cover this in our image processing course later this year, but whenever you pull kind of increase the contrast and brightness, it's called stretching an image, to bring out the detail in the faint outer arms, what happens is it also brightens the core. So quite often you'll see a galaxy image like this, where there might be some great detail in the outer arms, but the core is totally burnt out. So Dave is using some fairly clever processing techniques, I suspect, where he might be processing the core differently to the outer arms so that he doesn't burn out the entire image. But interesting colours there as well. I'd, we were talking... Um, I think it was Zenith or Jay, no, I think it was Jay actually, in discussion boards, been publishing some of his images. And anyway, I'm sorry if it's not you, Jay, but it was Jay or Zenith. And that they've, they've actually added on quite a lot of color saturation. And, you know, there's a part of image processing, which is art and personal preference. Now, some people might even see David's image here and think, oh, those colors are a bit a bit hard, a bit saturated, a bit in your face, but actually that's my taste. I do love astro images when uh, the color saturation has been increased so that we get to see some of those stunning colors. You'll see a whole bunch of, look, there's a couple here, a couple of examples here. You'll quite often see these posts 
um, in the discussion boards. And these are always under the member research and it's actually under the uh, A-team group. And uh, what these guys are doing, members of the A-team, they're monitoring near-Earth asteroids. And what they're doing here with these posts is they're just alerting other members of the group. Hey, listen guys, I'm gonna be observing this near-Earth asteroid, 2005 OX. Um, I'm gonna be using Neo. There you go. So Tony's been looking at this one a while. So he looked at it Monday with Chile. Uh, he's given some results there as well. In fact, those are his results that he's published to the rest of the group. So that's what they're doing in these posts where you just see the name of uh, an object like that. And uh, got, uh, Robert V here talking about uploading gifts. So don't, don't forget these practical astronomy uh, live casts are all about answering your questions. So always feel free to either email me if you don't want to post them in discussions or you can post them in discussions and I'll always uh, find them one way or another. And if it's something that we need to deal with, um, with, uh, in in a live show, then that's exactly what we do. And Robert's saying here, I tried to upload a, a GIF recently. Hey, listen, that opens up, doesn't it? That whole ridiculous Ferrari last year about is it GIF or GIF? Who cares? We all know what we mean. Anyway, tried to open it up, didn't accept it. Yeah, you might have been. It might have been too large, Robert. So I think there's an upload limit at the moment of about. 10 megabytes for a single file, um, much more than that, you know, and it can make, make things quite slow for members to load pages if they haven't got great bandwidth. So uh, that's going to be the only, uh, the only restriction there. So not a bug, but as you just insert it as a normal um, image. So if I was to reply to this and you just browse for it here in exactly the same way that you would any other uh, image and that will play when somebody opens it so a couple of posts there anything else we got down here that we ought to uh, cover mars missions people still chasing mars still slightly too small at the moment to uh, be showing any detail but i think we're just on the cusp of uh, being able to see some detail on mars and uh, what else have we got I've got a couple of questions here. I'll, I'll share this with you. So if you haven't seen this, it's quite cool. Uh, members will know that during the uh, Messier Marathon, just by coincidence, we were kind of halfway through the, the whole Messier Marathon, and we went to the homepage, and my pictures had racked up to exactly 9,000, but by coincidence, my reservations that I've made were around 2,000. Not around 2,000, it was it was a rounded up 2000 exactly the same what are the chances of that but william william yeager our member from 2003 surpasses that look at this 200,000 images william has snapped since he's been a member of slu which actually gives him a ranking of 1 so this is all based, if you remember, on gravity points and gravity points here are based on really activity on the SLU website. So activity can be setting up a mission. It can be snapping a, an image from a mission. It can be liking someone's post. It can be making a post. All of these things earn you gravity points. So that ranking and gravity points is really talking about a member's activity and uh, I think it's a cool thing to do. Anyway, congrats on that. That's a, a big milestone. I don't think I'm going to be overtaking you anytime soon, William. So uh, well done on that. Uh, let's have, oh, there's another little question down here uh, from Devum. Hello, Devum. Uh, Slew Apprentice. Um, what is the difference between Canary 2 wide field and ultra wide field? Oh, big, big difference there. Now then. Easy place to find this, Stephen. If you just go to the featured threads in uh, in discussions, hop down. This post will always be here. Observatory information and telescope specifications. And in here, 
uh, you'll see links to a whole bundle of posts. So it's really easy. You can always find all of this core information. And one of the posts here is Canary Islands Field of View Comparison. So up it comes. And loads of information here, but pitch paints a thousand words. So here we go. Um, this one shows the constellation cam that isn't online yet, but if we go to the next one, it zooms in, and you can see here the largest rectangle on the outside represents the field of view of the Canary 3 deep sky astrograph. Then you've got the Canary 2 ultra wide field telescope which is that second rectangle in, but then the largest square in a square is the Canary 2 wide field. So you can see there, there's a huge difference between the Canary 2 wide field telescope, which is that square, the larger of the two squares, and then the second rectangle in, which is the Canary 2 ultra wide field telescope. And you can see what we've got in here is that's the, uh, the Whirlpool galaxy. So it gives you a good idea of how that would look in all of the telescope views. And you can see here, the Canary 1 half meter telescope is very, very similar to the Canary 2 wide field. But then the smallest field of view is the Canary 4 solar system telescope, which is why that's so good at capturing planets, um, also planetary nebulae, or certainly smaller planetary nebula. And there's the same graphic showing the moon as your reference object, because everybody knows how big the moon looks in the sky. So this is just showing you the field of view uh, that the moon would look like within that field of view of each of the Canary Islands telescopes. And there's exactly the same thing for the Chile telescope. So who knows, Stephen might not be um, watching the show tonight. So we'll point him towards that um, tomorrow. But uh, we can hop down. Oh, somebody shared a great uh, sunrise over the Canary Islands this morning. That was good. And then we are going to get on uh, to the main post that we're going to talk about this evening. But here, Lewis B was, gosh, Lewis, you must have been up. You you are either up incredibly early or up incredibly late. I don't know where you are in the world, but to, to capture this. So this is from the uh, Horizon Cam, the Canary Islands Horizon Camp. And of course, we celebrated Equinox last week. Uh, hopefully you caught our show. We had some great live views from the solar telescope. Did a live cast watching that. So around this time of year, and certainly on the day of Equinox, the sun rises exactly due east. So this is not gonna be far off. You know, this morning's only four days past Equinox. So you know that the sun, that is, you know, almost directly due east and you can see that this camera has been set up to view exactly due east and if you're wondering what the rest of the view is looking at this camera is actually perched up 10,000 feet up on what's called pico del Tadi, which kind of on the island of uh, tenerife the volcanic island of tenerife you fly into it and that's what you see you see this incredibly obvious volcanic cone, this triangular volcanic cone. And everybody thinks that that is the volcano on Tenerife, but it's not. That's just one tiny cone, which itself is over 2000 feet tall, but that's just one tiny cone on the edge of a vast caldera. In other words, the basin of the actual volcano. And I have to drive through that caldera to get from the airport when I go to the observatory and drive up to Observatorio del Tedi. And what we're looking down on from here, so this camera is at 10,000 feet. The observatory, if you remember, is at 8,000 feet. So in this photograph, you can see it's uh, two layers of cloud here and the, the, the lower level of cloud. That's the normal layer of cloud. Uh, so we're normally above that. So just below where the sun is on this ridge, which you just see in silhouette, where I'm pointing now, that's where the observatory is. Observatorio del Tedi. It's operated by the Institute of Astrophysics of the Canary Islands, um, which are a superb organization. They have a university in La Laguna. They're linked to a lot of Barcelona and other Spanish universities on the mainland. Um, 
and they run, they operate actually, both of the main observatories in the Canary Islands. So we've got this one, Observatory El Daltedi, which is on the island of Tenerife. And then you have uh, the Rock de las Muchachos Observatory, which is on the island of La Palma. And uh, that's one of the neighboring islands. But anyway, I thought that was really a really great shot there. And if you ever want to see that particular view, then all you need to get, do is go off to the telescope pages, any of the Canary Islands telescope pages, even during the day, you can do this, scroll down and you hop over to the horizon cam. And this camera operates at night as well, as you can see. So you can see here, we've got a little bit of cloud up here, got a couple of stars showing up, um, but I'm just pointing to the observatory. In fact, this camera has actually just been kind of knocked up a little bit. I don't know if you've noticed that, but uh, you see this little, uh, it's a little um, I'm pointing to it on the screen over here. There's a little bit of light right over here on the horizon. That's actually the neighboring island of Gran Canaria. And that one is almost perfectly round. It is just one giant volcanic caldera, amazing island. So if you do get the opportunity to visit the Canary Islands, they actually do um, trips now around uh, Observatorio del Tedi. There's a company there and you'll see it advertised at the end. But oh, look at that spindle galaxy. Nice. Is that the spindle? No, it's not. Edge on spiral, still nice. I'm gonna snap a picture of that, excuse me. Talk amongst yourselves while I just snap a pic of that. Done, thank you very much. Canary Deep Sky 3. Let's have a look at the whole image on that. Looking nice. Pinpoint stars. Got a bit of a blue, blue haze going over it, haven't we? What's Canary 2 looking at at the moment? So anyway, thank you, Lewis, for uh, sharing that. Oh, there's an, a star. So Almaz, Epsilon Origae. So a peculiar eclipsing binary star. Visible star is an F-type supergiant. Oh, F-type. Let's talk about cars, shall we, tonight? Jaguar F-type is one of my dream cars. Anyway, let's get back to the subject at hand, because you know me from the Messier Marathon. I get a little bit distracted, don't I? So, um, and we're going to talk about the Messier Marathon. So hop over here to, and I think this is a featured post. I think this is in featured post still, featured threads. and. It's the My Progress on the Messier Marathon. So I'm going to close some of these other windows down. And Zenith, if you remember, was the first person the following day, would you believe, to publish his Messier Marathon poster. Now, this poster, if you remember, we provided a template in a variety of formats. We're going to look at two formats over the next 20 minutes and look at a PowerPoint. Um, format and the PNG, the image raster image format. Um, but what we did was we provided this template and this was uh, the original of this was generated by, created by a SLU member, long time SLU member, Andrew Dumbleton here in the UK. And uh, he gave me permission to adapt it a little bit, which I did for this year's marathon. And then what people are doing, what Zenith started doing here, I think he's finished it now. Uh, he put all of his snapped images from the Messier Marathon in these little boxes to build up this high resolution poster that you can then get framed um, or, or printed out your local printers and uh, and have it framed up on your wall. And a few members have done this. Now, I know Carol, Carol in South Africa, she was the first one to finish it. So where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Load more. Carol's so sweet. She says, here's my attempt. This is blinking brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And it's absolutely complete. So Carol was participating in the Messier Marathon and she stayed there right until the very end, until we got that all elusive Messier 30. And uh, there it is on, on this end. And you can see it's a little bit fuzzy and got a little bit of a light gradient on it. But that's because it was only four degrees above the horizon. But she stayed with the entire event for 10 hours, made sure she snapped every single object in the Messier catalogue. So we can see some of our favourites here, M42, we've got uh, the Orion Nebula, uh, we've got M13 here, the Hercules Cluster, we've got the Whirlpool Galaxy M51 here, uh, what else we've got, there's a little M43 as well, it looks like the Orion Nebula, but it's actually that little um, bit of nebulosity to uh, the, the 
the top of the Orion Nebula. Uh, we've got the Owl Nebula, that M57 up here, the Ring Nebula, that looked great that night. Oh, Black Eye, the Black Eye Galaxy. Messi 64, I think that one is. We've got M97, is it? I think, or M96, Owl Nebula. Um, and then, uh, what is it? Oh, M101 down here, bottom left-hand side. That's the Pinball Galaxy, the one we saw live a minute ago. Where's my other favourite? Where's uh, M33? So, uh, this one here. Yeah, pointing to it here. Triangulum Galaxy. I think that was one of my favourite objects of the entire night. It looked glorious. But anyway, Carol was the first person to finish her Messier Marathon uh, poster. And I hope you got this printed out uh, at the moment, Carol. I hope you got that stuck on your wall. Uh, but to honestly, you were you were so sweet in the way you presented that, as if, oh, this was my attempt. I wasn't sure about it. It was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Oh, right. And we've got another one from only today. Larry T. Nice work. Said so didn't spend up too much time cleaning up the individual images, you know, and it's it's kind of nice to be able to clean up the individual images. But as we were saying on the night, because we, we fought, didn't we? We fought the wind. So quite a few of the Canary 4 and Canary 3 uh, images were kind of a bit wind blown. Um, but this was about a collection activity. This was about capturing every single Messier object in a single night. And that's what we did. You know, you're not going to image. If you want to image uh, a Messier object, you're not going to do it when it's right down on the horizon. No. If you want a good quality image, you want to image it when it's at least 30 degrees above the horizon. But I always recommend go at least 45, higher if you can. So that's what you do. So there is another exercise that you can go through with this particular poster, which is over the course of a year making sure that you capture every Messier object when it's best positioned and also the best possible image you can get of it as well. You know, so only include the best image when the seeing conditions were absolutely perfect, when the telescope was absolutely perfect. You know, just seeing a couple of other favorites there, look, there's M82 down here, the exploding galaxy. Some people call that the Cigar Galaxy. Hey, the uh, Eagle Nebula M16 looked rather good, didn't it? Then we've got Swan Nebula. We've got the Lagoon Nebula as well. Gosh, that was a cracking night. But what if you want to generate one of these posters yourself? So I'm just going to scroll down and uh, make sure we're not missing anybody off the roll list. Oh, cool. Uh, Larry's actually uh, <laughs> written up how he did his. Um, and he's using the PNG um, poster. Ah, he was using uh, GIMP, which is one I was going to recommend to you because GIMP is a processing tool, which is program, which is free. Uh, he grabbed in his images, made sure that they were 180 by 180 pixels, copied the selection to clipboard, pasted into the poster, positioned them. And then look at this last point that Larry's put down. Yeah, that's a funny one, Larry. Just repeat that 109 times so the rest of your Messier objects. Very good. I like that. You got a big like from me. I'll write something about that later. Oh no, Carol, you spotted a mistake. You got M8 twice. Never mind. I'm sure, like your um, your great galaxy classification um, graphic that you did, uh, your uh, you'll soon have another version on the way. Anyway, where do you get hold of the template for it? Well, hop over to the discussion boards, go into Livecast using this forum index, go down to 2018 Slew Messier Marathon. And then we can come down here. And then here we go, Messier Marathon poster template. So if you go in here, we've got a couple of templates here. We've got a PDF version, uh, there's also the PNG version as well. And I think further down, I published another version as well. Yeah, there we go. So right down the bottom, you can get the PowerPoint version, and you get the PNG version. So how would you go about sticking in one of your images? Well, let's start off with just grabbing 
a single image. And we're going to cover so much of this stuff in more detail in the um, in the image processing courses, which we're currently putting together. Lots of work to do there. So, uh, right. So let's find uh, some of my Messier snaps from that night. And I think I'm going to filter because I've got quite a few images here. So let's try and find Nebulae. We'll use, uh, go for one of the Canary 2 uh, telescopes. And in fact, that's getting me roughly where I want to be. It's got Running Man there. We've got the Owl, Dumbbell. Let's take a look through here, see if we can find a favorite. Uh, I've got the Eagle there. Dumbbell, Eagle again. Where's the Lagoon? I'd really like the Lagoon because I love that. I love that nebula. It's a good example to use. Oh, no, it's going back too far. Gosh. So I obviously didn't get that one um, with that particular telescope. I must have snapped it with one of the others. So let's... Um, Okay, then. let's let's use dumbbell as our example. So Messier 27. So here we are. Click on it here. We we want one of our color images. So we're going to pick. Uh, let's go for this one. I'm going to click the download button because I want a local copy of it. So it pops it up. I right click, save image as. I'm going to save that to my desktop. So I've got hold of that. And. Now then this is where we might have a, a couple of little tech issues this evening, but uh, give me a couple of seconds and I'll be with you. Talk amongst yourselves. Right, so I've, I've downloaded my image that I want to put in to my poster. Let's uh, take a little look here. Hopefully we're going to use the PowerPoint one to start off with and hopefully it will allow me to share that. It wasn't allowing me. If you remember I had uh, difficulty sharing this um, during the show. But anyway here it comes. Got it coming up here. So showing my entire desktop here because I can't uh, unfortunately do it any other way. But here we've got PowerPoint then uh, open here. And here you can see the template that we've got. And what we want to do is we're talking about M27. So we know where that is it's in here, the Dumbbell Nebula. This is the box that we need to be in. Now, the joy of using the PowerPoint version is you don't have to go through those same same steps that Larry went through to resize the images because in PowerPoint, all you got to do, there's my image that I've just downloaded, is drag it over to PowerPoint and there it is. And PowerPoint obviously has the great resizing tools. So here we go. Put it in there. Uh, where's M27 gone? Put it in here. Let's zoom in a bit on there. So hopefully you can see it's nice and clear. So this is why in discussions I was recommending that if you do have PowerPoint, use PowerPoint to do it because it is so easy. It's literally just drag and drop. So there it is. I've lined it up in that top corner. I'm going to reduce the size of it now. And in fact, the images even snap to the edges as well. You know, but you know, that's quite small in there, isn't it? So what you can also do in here is in PowerPoint, you can crop it as well. And I think that's you get to um, is it, uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, crop. So all I did was right click and crop. And then all I've got to do is drag this in because I want to zoom in on this because we know that it's a high resolution image because of the size it came in to begin with. It's not keeping it a square format, which is a shame, but then we can increase it in size again. Oh, I see, that's, I see how that's working. Okay, so we'll have it quite large. Crop it to there, crop it to 
lost my little edge. There it is there. I haven't done that particularly accurately, but uh, you can tell with some finessing, this is a really, really easy way of generating this poster. You don't have to get anywhere near image processing uh, software. And there you go. You know, I think that is a really, really easy way of generating this poster, all right? Because you don't need any other software to do it. Oh, got a stray M51 in there. Get rid of that. You see another one there and there I was doing. Um, but there are other options as well. So we've got the PNG option, and this is the option where we uh, where we talk about um, using image processing software, and you can use GIMP just like Larry did. Um, uh, so that uh, it's, you really need a layer based if you can. Having a layer based uh, image processing uh, program is is it, it's got some benefits, but you can, you can get away without it because you can cut and paste like we're going to do now. So here is our M27 Dumbbell Nebula box. Uh, now it says crop and resize to 284 by 284. That's not strictly true because in this PNG version, you actually have to resize it, as Larry found out, to 180 by 180. So all we're going to do is we're going to bring in our image. So there it is, brought it into our image processing software. Let's see uh, what kind of crop we can do. Because actually we don't, you know, we want to show these, the actual objects, so they're quite large in that box, don't we? So let's just see what kind of, box we get so i'm just drawing around it so that's okay that would be quite nice so and then hopefully you can see in the bottom of the window it's uh the program's just giving me the actual size so i know i i can't get it down to um there you go, 308 by 308 okay that's okay so this is not down to 180 by 180 but we can see actually if i did 180 by 180 it's going to be tiny it's not going to get the whole uh, nebula in. So all I'm doing is I'm just framing it in the first place with a box, a square box, because we know that's what we want. And actually, we're going to go slightly bigger this time. We're going to go 264 by 264. Then I'm just going to crop that, cropped it. Then I'm going to resize it because at the moment it's 265 pixels by 265. We know that we want it 180 by 180. We're going to resize it. 180, make sure that we maintain the aspect ratio. And there it is. So there's our image, nice and ready, but how do we get it into our other PNG image? Well, just like Larry did with GIMP, I'm just gonna press Control C, or you can go in your image processing software and hit copy. It's normally edit, copy in there. Then we can go to our uh, main poster, and we can do control L in this case, because I want it on a, on a new layer. All right, and we'll zoom back in because it always puts it right in the middle. And we'll scroll up a bit. And then I'm just gonna go to my move tool. I'm gonna grab hold of that. I'm gonna scroll up. I'm gonna zoom in a bit more so I can place it with a degree of accuracy. So just pull it up here. And there we go. Okay, that's cool. There it is. One down, and as Larry said, <laughs> only 109 <laughs> left. So listen, you can see that you don't need to be an image processing guru, right, to be able to create something that really is, as you've seen from those other examples, something that really turns out to be spectacular, you know, um, so give it a go and maybe think about using the same kind of idea um, for capturing your other images. And don't forget, just because you missed, if you did miss uh, the Messier Marathon, um, doesn't mean that you can't use this same template. Um, let's hop down to uh, Larry's again. And uh, thanks, Larry, for sharing uh, how you did that. And it's, you know, it's always great if you do share anything like this, 
uh, in discussion boards, just pop in there the steps that you went through to create it. And you'll see that quite often with a lot of the people who um, generate their own uh, images like David, like that one that we saw at the top of the live cast. Um, they'll often put down the software that they use and the steps that they went through to generate that particular image. And that just helps other members if they want to emulate you. And I'll tell you, when Dave, uh, when David first started at SLU, he learned from uh, other members who were posting, this is how I did it. So anyway, have a look at this post. And actually what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be generating more of these templates, uh, which are maybe a little bit more challenging. So if you remember in the run up to the Messier Marathon, Keith Smith, uh, who's down under in New Zealand, told us about uh, the Southern Hemisphere catalog, the Bennett catalog, which has got a whole bunch of really spectacular Southern objects in it. So I'm going to create one of these so that you can generate your own Bennett collection of images, but also I'm doing the big one, not the NGC, not the new general catalog with 7,840 or objects or whatever it is, which Maynard has actually collected images of every single object in that catalog. No, I'm going to be doing one for what's called the Herschel 400. And that's a really fascinating catalog, astronomical catalog, uh, which identifies you know, just uh, such a broad range of really fascinating objects. Uh, and that would make a really good collection activity. So if you're stuck for what you want to view through SLU's telescopes, don't be. Um, just start collecting, choose a catalogue and start setting up missions for those objects to make sure you capture them all. So, you know, Hopefully, what I've done there is a very brief um, intro. Oh, look, Canary One's coming online. Has the wind dropped? He asks himself. Um, so it, it's, it is easier than you think. Oh, no, that's not very good, is it? Oh, dear, that's two images. A bit skew whiff, I would say. A skew whiff. That's a good, uh, a good expression, isn't it? Skew with. A um, bit of slew art there, snap an image of that so I remember it. Check out what went wrong with that. Intergalactic Wanderer is um, actually a globular cluster that's kind of spinning around orbiting our Milky Way galaxy. Fascinating object if you want to read up about it. So uh, anyway, that's quite cool. I'm, I'm surprised that the winds are not still too strong. Let's take a quick look at conditions before we finish off. But anyway, what I was trying to show you tonight was Look, it really can be as simple as dragging and dropping to get some really stunning results. Um, so maybe try your hand with this. Jump in at the deep end. If you remember, Zenith had never done anything like this before. And if you hop over the discussion boards, uh, there's a post in here that you must look at. Um, is it so we need to make that featured? I'm sorry, we haven't made that uh, featured. And it's titled we'll make this feature so you can find it easier um my first month um with slu i think it is um there you go there it is uh my first month of slu and zenith disc is this great write-up from going from a, an absolute novice joining slu four weeks ago and before you know it he threw himself in at the deep end and suddenly He's been generating images like these. Look at that, that's the Orion Nebula uh, that he's processed himself. So he's taken the raw data and he's processed himself. But we are going to be looking at this in this image processing course, because I know a lot of you out there have expressed an interest in doing some image processing. So we're going to go through it. But just keep in your mind, it is simpler than sometimes others make it look. And when you start talking about fixed data and stuff like that, you know, you don't need, that's not where we're going to start in our image processing course. We're going to start off working with PNGs and you will be astounded with what you can generate with SLU's PNGs, how you can improve them. But it sky's the limit. So if you want to generate your own fits data from your missions and then process all of that, you can land up with this. But one thing's for certain, what you need to do is jump in with both feet.
there's always plenty of advice over in the discussion boards and uh, when we start the image processing course you can follow along with me live during the live cast as we do things and you'll be able to ask me questions live during the show and then after the show as well so anyway uh that is it for me tonight um thank you very much for joining me uh i'm paul cox this has been practical astronomy with slew bye for now <laughs>